Welcome everybody. Welcome to our fourth My HCPC Standards event. Really looking forward to you joining us today um, and hope that you enjoy the next sort of 45-50 minutes with us looking at uh, the HCP standards. Um, it's really nice to, for you to join us. This is the fourth one we've done and we have really enjoyed the last ones and we know we're getting lots of you joining and lots of you joining on, on YouTube so that's really nice. So um, a couple of sort of things to say. I'm just going to be looking over slightly to my left because I'm going to be uh, got my double screen over there so I'll just be looking at that slightly. Uh, this is what we're going to cover today, um, my HCPC roles and standards. We're going to look at that again. I know we've looked at it before but it's useful just to ping it around again and just discuss it again. We're going to look at standard four and we're going to look at delegation and patient safety and a couple of sort of housekeeping things before we start if that's all right. Uh, the session will last about 45-50 minutes. We won't go up beyond that because we know that you've got really important jobs to do. We will be using a polling app called Slido during the session which we'll talk to you a little bit about as we go through through which we find really useful and we will be getting some evaluation data from you to find out whether you've enjoyed these sessions or not. At the end of the session there will be a survey that we'll send out for you um, and that survey once you've done the survey you uh, get a uh, certificate to say that you've been today which is really nice um, so we're finding that's a really useful way of connecting with you as well so that's great so we're going to look at delegation and patient safety uh, that's standard four and that's what we're going to be dis um, discussing today for the next um, 45 50 minutes so a bit of a start really so hello my name is I'm sure you've met me on the uh, recent the last webinars but just a quick reminder I'm Kim Tolley I'm a professional liaison consultant at the HCPC um, and I've got my hello my name is badge with me today um, because that's really something I'd like to promote every webinar that we do so hello my name is was a campaign and I've talked about it in the last webinars by a doctor called Dr. Kate Granger, who noticed that professionals weren't introducing themselves to uh, patients when they were caring for them. So she promoted, hello, my name is, and you'll see these badges uh, on every healthcare professional, and you probably got one as well. I'm very proud, very proud of mine. Um, do look, do look up about Dr. Kate Granger because she writes lots of really good stuff, not only about hello, my name is, but also about the important things um, about care because she noticed that the only person who introduced himself to her was the porter who was weaning her to x-ray and she blogs and talks about her experiences and unfortunately she died a couple of years ago now but her legacy particularly in hello my name is really lives on so i'm going to ask a couple of my colleagues who i'm joined with um, at the hcpc to introduce themselves if they wouldn't mind so i'm going to start hello my name's kim i'm a nurse by profession and employed by the hcpc to talk about our standards and guidance olivia would you mind saying who you are what you do at the hcpc yeah yeah hi so my name is olivia bird and i am a policy manager in the policy and standards team uh, so we're the team that uh, writes and review the standards that we're going to be discussing today and i'm going to be helping out with answering some of your questions Thanks, Olivia. And Matt. Hi, my name is Matt Clayton. I'm a senior policy officer at the HCPC. I work with Olivia and Grace. And uh, much the same as Olivia, I work in the policy team and answer inquiries and help with standards. Thanks, Matt. And Grace, another we're lucky to be joined by three members of our policy team today. So Grace. Yeah, hello, my name is Grace Costain. I am a senior policy officer in the policy and standards team. Uh, work with Matt and Olivia. So very nice to, um, well, e meet you today. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, well, I won't flick you all onto video as we're going around. Hello, my name is, but once uh, they start talking to you specifically about the standards, we'll, we'll go on video so you can actually see them. We've got Holly who's joined us before our events and communications. Holly, do you want to say hello? Yes, hi there. <clears throat> my name's Holly. Um, I am the events and communications officer at the HCPC, um, so I help to organise all the events um, in the organisation and help with communication activities as well. And Kelly's here, Kelly. Yes, good afternoon everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Kelly and I am the Professionalism and Upstream Regulation Lead at the HCPC and um, looking forward to hearing all about the standards this afternoon. Yeah, thanks very much. So it's really nice that we're joined by quite a few people because basically they're the absolute experts on our standards and guidance. Um, so we will, if we've got difficult questions, 
I hope that Matt, Grace and Olivia are on, are on standby, which is always really nice. So just a bit of GDPR regulations, just so that you know that you have given us your emails uh, to allow us to invite you to this session today. Um, we will only be using your emails and contact details for this session and also for the evaluation survey, which we'll send out at the end. Um, but any comments in that survey might be really useful to us to look at the learning that we can take from this session. So just a bit about GDPR. Um, so the Slido website, um, I'm hoping that you might be on that because we will have you will have got some information in the uh, the joining instructions. Um, but this is a polling uh, website that we find quite useful to look at to get some evaluation from you and to see whether you think this is useful or not. So on the website, when you go into the event, you can type in hashtag. We don't have to type the hashtag because that's already there, but my HCPC standard for Sometimes you have to tick another little box before you get in, but that enables us to ask you questions. So I'm going to flick over to the first question, which is a very, very straightforward one. Um, but it's what professional group do you belong to? Now, some of the professional groups are actually, if you go down, you'll need to go down the screen to look at the, the other professional groups. But let's see who's who's around on the call, if that's all right. So we've got some occupational therapists and some physiotherapists. Sometimes it takes a little while. There's a bit of a lag while your information goes up to the cloud, wherever it does go up to, and then it bounces back down again. Uh, we've got some paramedics and physiotherapists. Oh, this is exciting. We've got some hearing. Oh, no, nobody from hearing aid dispenser, no dietitians around. Oh, a dietitian. Thank you. Thank you. That's lovely. This really gives us lots of information about who you are and enables us to think about maybe who we're not accessing because that's important that we need to think about that in the future um, because obviously the HCPC regulates our 15 professional groups um, and we need to be you know seeing who we can seeing how we can access all of you to help you and support you in the really difficult jobs that you're you're actually doing particularly at the moment and as I should have said before but we would love to be doing this session in person unfortunately we're having to do the session virtually which is such a shame um, and one day I hope to meet you in real in real time so to speak but we're all getting used to the virtual life that we're living at the moment and thank you for your responses because they are actually really helping so um, I'm going to stop that one at the minute and I'm going to ask you my next question which again is really useful because what word comes to mind when you think of the HCPC? Now I always reflect on this one myself because as I said I'm a nurse by profession uh, and I know that there are certain words that come to mind when I think of the NMC and it's really helpful again for us to see what sort of words you associate with us because it enables us to think about how we're seen externally as an organisation um, and I can see that you're saying helpful that's good and supportive I'm hoping that we are helpful and supportive today that's what we want to be um, but you're right we're there to regulate you we're there to be a to be an advocate for patient safety and we are a patient safety organisation that is our our key aim um, oh this is fantastic there's some really good words coming up so thank you for those um, I'm looking down at my phone so I do apologise but I'm organising the polling through my phone like it's, it's being used as a sort of a, as a remote so I do apologise for that if I'm looking down occasionally so thank you that's actually really helpful and you're right right in the middle the bigger the word the more people are saying it and you're right we are a regulator that is that is actually what we do so a couple of other questions just in, to enable us to see whether this was useful this session for you um, that we'll come to as we as we go on if that's okay so I'm going to go back to my slides if that's okay brilliant um, I'm just going to point out to you that you could use Slido to ask questions or what we would prefer you to do if that's all right because it's quite complicating monitoring the Slido and the chat and we'd like to ask you if you wouldn't mind using our questions in chat or using the chat function uh, on on the screen here today in the teams in the team sort of um, platform to ask questions it would just be really useful if you just use that it's just really helpful we will look at the slido as well but it's just really useful just to keep them in in chat so what's the HCPC role? Well, our role and functions is fairly straightforward. We are there to regulate uh, you as healthcare professionals. Uh, we're there to maintain the register of healthcare professionals. Um, and we're also there to, to write those standards and guidance. And we're going to be looking at standards and guidance as we go along. Um, we're there to quality assure education as well. Um, and we're also there for fitness to practice. So when our, when profession, professionals don't meet the standards required of them, um, there is a potential to um, use fitness to practice and that is part of our statutory obligation, our statutory role really. So that's the uh, roles, that's the standards that we actually 
produce and I think they're really excellent and I've only been working for the HCPC for a couple of months now um, but I found them really really useful because they clearly set out what the profession expect of you sorry what patients and the profession indeed expect of you so we've got there our standards for education and training our CPD and registration uh, standards the orange ones um, our particular standards of proficiency and they are one of those for every professional group and then our standards of conduct performance and ethics which actually cover all professional groups and as I said this is what's expected of you as healthcare professionals and we're going to be talking about those and that's what this whole webinar series of webinars is about really we've got 10 or you've got 10 standards of conduct performance and ethics and we're looking at each standard in each webinar so today we're looking at standard four OK, so standard four um, is actually about delegation and, and it, that involves delegation and supervision. And we're going to be looking at both those concepts today. So before we start, I'm going to ask you one more question on polling, if that's OK. And I'm going to ask you how we, you would rate your current understanding or current knowledge and understanding of standard four of the HCPC standards of conduct, performance and ethics. Now thinking about it, so for example, do you know how many parts there are in standard four? Um, and that gives you a really good, if you know how many parts there are and what they actually say, then you know, you're going to be a 10. And if you're not sure what they actually say, you're going to probably be the middle. Um, so that's just really useful for us to give a, an idea of where people are with their knowledge and um, their knowledge of standard four, because um, what we're going to do at the end of this webinar, we're going to be quite cheeky and we're going to ask you where you are at the end as well um, and how you feel about um, standard four at the end. And, and you can see that there's a wide range and I would expect that. Um, I would expect that totally because goodness sake, um, you know, as thinking about myself again, um, the NMC code of conduct, do I know everything the NMC code of conduct says, even though I might have read it, you know, six months ago, actually my memory will probably be at a bit of a loss. So thank you for that. It's given us a really, really good idea of where you are. And I think that's really helpful because, and again, it enables us to see where you are at the end. So let's look at what it actually says. Um, so standard four is about delegation, I said, but it's got two parts. And the first part is delegation. You must not only delegate work to somebody, um, you sorry, you must only delegate work to somebody who's got the knowledge, skills and experience. And those three things are really important, the knowledge, skills and experience. And the second part of standard four is about supervision. So when you delegate something to somebody, you must also be prepared to supervise and support them. And that's the sort of second part really of, of standard four. And we're going to look at look at both those parts as we as we work through, really. So we're going to look at the first one um, now and we get we're lucky enough to get lots of queries um, from you as registrants uh, to our standards colleagues uh, and they get lots of queries and, and concerns. So we can use these queries and concerns to sort of help us in these sessions. Um, delegation is about asking your colleague to provide care or treatment, but only delegating if that professional is it's within that professional scope of practice and continuing to provide appropriate supervision and support, as I've said. So let's look at a real life example. OK, so I'm going to let you just pause to let you to read about Sunita, who is a paramedic. And then I'm going to come to Matt to get him to answer that question. I'm going to send Matt's picture live so you can actually see a picture of Matt on screen, which I think is quite useful. So Matt, you're going to go live to the screen if that's OK. Um, you should be coming on now and you can come off mute and have a word. Um, and Matt, this is a real life question that comes up, isn't it really, about delegating care to somebody who isn't your, in your, who is, works alongside you as another healthcare professional, but may not be trained in the same way. So Matt, would you mind saying what you would say to this uh, registrant and this registrant query, if you don't mind? Yes, so this is something that we've gotten in the past. It's um, there we are. So this is something we've gotten in the past, and um, I think it's a common question for people who are talking about supervision, particularly when they're not, su uh, sorry, delegation, when they're not delegating to someone who's exactly the same level as them. And so the first thing we'd want to point out to people is to understand what our standards do. So because we regulate 15 different professions, we're not going to have standards that cover every single aspect of every type of query for our different professions. So we think of our policies as quite high level and we look at how people use their professional judgment and what tasks they take on to meet our standards. So in this case, the first two things to look at are the standards of proficiency for paramedics. 
and this was a common standard of proficiency across most of our professions, which means that you're going to be responsible for the decisions you take and be able to back up the decisions you take. And then secondly, looking at the delegation itself. Uh, like you were saying earlier, Kim, it's important to think of delegation as a process rather than a single event. So once you've delegated work to someone, it doesn't mean that your work is finished. It means that you are still playing a role in supervision. So with that covered, what we would specifically talk about in this case is that when you're delegating to someone, like you mentioned earlier, it's about making sure they've got the skills, knowledge and experience. So the, so the HCPC isn't going to have a specific standard saying what skills and knowledge you need to have to fill this exact role, but the person needs to be able to have the skills, knowledge and experience to undertake the work that you've delegated to them. Yeah. And I think that's right. I think that's really nice, Matt, because I think it's it's actually thinking about whether they are able then to respond, isn't it, to sort of changes in the patient condi condition if they're in the back of the ambulance, isn't it, really? Exactly. So it's about knowing that not only that they know how to do what they do, but also that they know how to know when to do it, exactly, yes. which is a very contrived way of saying <laughs> that they need to be able to notice when something is going wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly for paramedics and our other professions that have medical entitlements and um, can prescribe and administer things under exemptions, those are never things that you can delegate to someone. So, for example, if you had administered a medication that only you as a qualified paramedic are allowed to administer, the supervision of the patient after that has to be done by someone else who's got that same medical entitlement. You can't delegate those rights, for example, because that person might not know exactly what they're looking for to see if there's a bad reaction with that medication. And I think the bottom line is that we're going to rely on people's professional judgment to make sure that they're delegating responsibly, supervising people, and that the people that they've asked to take on the work have got the skills and knowledge they need to have. Yeah, brilliant, Matt. Thank you. That's that's perfect. I really I really like that answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brilliant. And I'm going to move on to the next um, example now, um, and I'm going to ask the lovely uh, Grace. I'm just going to put you on live, Grace. Sorry. Um, if Grace could answer this one. I'm going to let people read it for a second, Grace, if that's all right. Um, and we've met Samantha before. So we met Samantha actually in our last session because she'd been re redeployed to critical care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and now she started work there and she's a bit worried because she's been delegated tasks that are actually outside her scope of practice. We actually looked a little bit about scope of practice last time and Samantha. So Grace, what would you what would you say to this to this sort of inquiry that came in? Yeah, so we've had quite a few um, queries like this come in over the past few months um, of COVID. And um, first, I'd just like to say that we've been really impressed with how our registrants have um, dealt with um, re, re being redeployed and um, adapting their practice in these circumstances. Um, so during COVID, um, it's meant that a lot of um, professionals have had to adapt to the way that they work and it's led to quite a few people being redeployed. So um, if I bring us back to last session, our standards um, require individuals to always act within their scope of practice, which means acting within the limits of your skills, knowledge and experience. Um, so in this context, um, if you're being redeployed, we've got no problem with that happening, but um, it ne you need to be able to practice still safely and effectively and within the limits of your knowledge and skills. So in this circumstance, Samantha um, does has advised that it is outside of her scope of practice. So we would immediately advise her to take a look at standard seven, which is about raising concerns. So we'd advise Samantha to raise a concern with her manager that the um, tasks that she's being asked to carry out um, are outside of her scope of practice, she doesn't feel comfortable. Um, and once she's raised those concerns with her manager, um, if they're not acted upon appropriately, then it would be for Samantha to escalate those concerns either to somebody else higher up in the organisation, such as um, the HR department. It may also be that Samantha would want to um, raise her concerns or contact her, um, her union if she was a member of them. Yep, that's great, Grace. Yeah, that's that 
brings me nicely. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> on to my next slide. So uh, just hold on a second and I'll move to the next slide if that's right, because I think you've um, again hit the nail on the head and you're, I know you're getting lots of queries about uh, COVID related issues um, and you've been very impressed, as you said, with people stepping up and changing their practice. Um, but on my next slide sort of clearly points that out really and it's got it's all about standard seven, isn't it? Exactly like you said. Standard seven is about raising concerns and standard seven gives you lots of advice about who to raise concerns to. We did look at this in the last session um, and we talked a little bit in the last session about who you could raise concerns with. Um, but also we will be doing that in standard seven webinar. We'll be looking a lot more at that. And remember last session, we also thought about who was your freedom to speak up guardian. Um, so again, I hope you found out who they are and if they are helpful to you. But yeah, there's a raft of information on our website about who to raise concerns concern to um, if you've got any particular worries. So I'm going to pause for a second um, because Olivia has been kindly um, on Holly have been kindly monitoring our chat box which I haven't been able to see because I'm presenting. Um, Olivia is there anything coming particularly that we would need to answer? Yes so I've seen a couple of questions. Um, one um, it's on the chat bar uh, Kelly has raised it is that um, Paul has asked if we could state the difference between um, policy and guidelines. Uh -huh. uh, I, I think it might be helpful to explain it might be this is relates to quite a few of the different documents that um, the team publish and um, particularly in the policy and standards team we have guidance documents and we have standards documents. So in terms of the standards when you are registering and whenever you're renewing you have to declare that you continue to meet those standards in your practice and our standards of conduct, performance and ethics, you need to meet those at all times. Whereas our standards of proficiency, you have to meet as far as they relate to your current scope of practice. So there are requirements that you sort of declare in your ongoing registration that you're continuing to meet those standards. So there's a particular status with standards that's linked to registration and part of your registration requirements. Our guidance is is sort of supplementary to that so it's not something that you um, they aren't standards in that same way they are providing further information um, and advice for registrants on how to meet those standards how to embed those into their practice so they have a slightly different status to um, standards in that they're not um, I'm not they're not standards no, help I'm going quite repetitive here no, but they give fine. you that supplementary information so I think yeah. that's sort of a key difference and obviously therefore when you're considering them, when you're applying your professional judgment, you have a bit more flexibility when you're referring to guidance to think about how that applies to your particular role, your particular scope and therefore how you're going to apply it. Um, policy then is a much more overarching term in terms of HCPC, we issue sort of policy statements that sort of clarify how we um, might be responding to a particular event. So for COVID, for example, there's been quite a few sort of COVID related policies that we've produced about how things like fitness for practice are going to take account um, the pandemic and the circumstances all of our registrants are working in. Uh, we might also be um, responding to sort of external sort of policy change. The policy is quite an overarching yeah. um, term. Um, so that's why it's quite, I guess, difficult to give sort of a specific definition, <laughs> but um, slightly different to you know, our standards and guidance, which are the key sort of focus of this this event. So. Brilliant. I think that's really helpful. It's, it's really helpful and you made it very simplistic. I really get that and I think that it's important to note that the guidance can't cover every single issue. Matthew pointed it out right at the beginning didn't he? He said the guidance can't cover every little case study that we, we show which I think is great that we can interpret the guidance because we are applying your professional judgment which you pointed out. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else Olivia? Yes yeah, so we had another question I've seen on Slido which was um, talking about in the pandemic, everyone's used working in different roles and how delegation might be affected um, yeah. when you're working in a different role. So I guess it comes back to the advice that um, Grace and Matt have already covered around. It's, it's quite closely linked to your scope of practice. So when you're working in a new role, um, it's important that you continue to practice within that scope of practice, uh, within your scope of practice at the limit of your skills, knowledge and experience. And your scope of practice might look very different to it did you know, pre-pandemic a few months ago, um, but it will have evolved to become this new scope of practice and this new role that you're taking on. Uh, and delegation, the rules around that still apply. So if you're then delegating to somebody in this new role, in this new capacity, you also need to make sure that who you're delegating to is getting that same sort of support 
um, or training if required to make sure that that's now part of their scope of practice too. Um, I guess the key thread across all of this is that you want to make sure that you and the team or anyone that you're delegating to or supporting is still able to deliver their job safely and effectively um, isn't putting patients at risk. So I appreciate it's really challenging with roles or changing and being very different to something that you might be used to. Um, it's just sort of recognising, I guess, that everybody is in that same position and therefore thinking about when you're delegating work, if somebody needs that extra support to get them to where they need to be and um, to continue to carry out that role safely and effectively. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Olivia. That's fantastic. OK, so thank you for that. We'll carry on and we'll pause for some more questions as we go along, if that's OK. Um, brilliant. Thank you. So um, the next part of the webinar is really about delegation. Oh, sorry, it's about supervision. My apologies, it's all about delegation, but it's about supervision. Supervision support, which we've talked quite a lot about, particularly in those two examples about the supervision support both Sunita and Samantha will actually need um, in, the, in those situations. So. We were lucky enough in 2019 to commission Newcastle University to actually look at peer and clinical, sorry, clinical supervision, which involves peer supervision um, and clinical supervision. And they actually uh, did a really good report for us, which shows that the importance of supervision for all of us, for all healthcare professionals. So we thought it would be really useful to share some of that information with you now um, so that you've got some of the findings that we actually found and, and hopefully they'll be useful to you and you can apply them in your role. Um, Newcastle specifically talked about there being two sorts of supervision, clinical and peer supervision. And I think it's quite quite nice to make a distinction between them um, and sort of think about the professions that use clinical and peer supervision. Um, so clinical supervision is about sitting down, sitting down with a senior usually to reflect. Um, and some professional groups are really good at um, supervision. I'm thinking of particularly of practitioner psychologists who are excellent at getting regular su clinical supervision. And it involves reflecting on clinical supervision, clinical situation and learning from those. And peer supervision is something a little bit more informal, really. Um, it's sometimes done over a coffee with a peer. It doesn't have to be a senior. It, it's usually with somebody that we work, work alongside with. Um, and that includes also being reflective and it includes sharing, sharing information, sharing views on team working, collaboration, but also helping each other with things like advice, career planning and those sort of things. So it's usually somebody that you trust and somebody that you built up a relationship with. So there's those two types of, of supervision. Um, but thinking about supervision now, and I'm going to ask you again to go to Slido if you don't mind, it's really useful for us, uh, and I'm sorry I'm looking down at my phone, for us to ask you about supervision. So as a group, we've got lots of people on the call today. Do you have regular supervision at work? At least, and I'm calling regular, which we're going to talk about in a bit, at least once a month. All right, so I've defined regular as at least once a month because actually this report that we're going to talk about in a minute uh, recommends that you should have clinical super if you're going to have clinical supervision, it should be usually once a month is quite a good point to have it. Um, and re the reality of sort of current working environments, it can be really difficult to, to give up that time and to have that time. Um, and I can see there that over half of you said yes, which is which is really, really good that you're having clinical supervision every at least every month. Uh, that's changing a little bit. As we can see, it's gone up a little bit, which is, really, which is really nice. So let's just leave it to run for just a few minutes because there are huge benefits uh, to clinical supervision. And that's what this report showed us really. Effective clinical supervision really helps with things like job satisfaction, staff retention, particularly at the moment. I think that we all feel, you know, that it's exhausting at the moment. Um, and actually to have something that actually helps with things like job satisfaction is really, really useful. So thank you, I'm gonna go off there now, but it's that's really heartening to see that 70% of you are having clinical supervision at least once a month, which is really, really great to actually see. Um, so this is a bit about, and I've already started talking about why it's so important. So supervision generally is seen as a way of valuing staff. Um, it makes, it provides sort of a space really because we're not very good as health professionals at giving up a space or having a space to reflect and develop ourselves. We usually just get on with what we're doing and we don't spend time to think about what went well, what didn't go so well. And because of that, your confidence can improve after clinical supervision because you actually had time to think about those things. Uh, it fosters better team working um, and it sort of provides more support in the work 
the workplace really facilitates reflection and self-awareness and also there's quite a lot of evidence to show that it actually reduces stress and anxiety which is pretty amazing really um, and for example psychologists uh, who particularly were working in the community reported that if they had really good supervision it actually helped them maintain their well-being something that's really important to us at the moment in covid is maintaining our well-being so for me there's something about developing a safe, trustworthy relation an environment where we can actually be honest and be truthful um, and to allow us to feel valued and supported and to help us maintain our well-being um, in, in our particular difficult situation. So it has huge positive benefits. Um, I'm going to pause again quickly um, because I have put this slide here to remind me to pause again. Uh, Olivia, is there any questions that are coming in that we can answer before we carry on to the next bit of looking at supervision? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So somebody's asked if supervision would form part of CPD and supervision is one of the examples that we um, give in our CPD guidance of pro a professional activity that could count towards your um, your CPD um, profile. So that's that's helpful to know. And that's about supervising others. But you might want to include also conversations you have with your supervisor as part of reflection as part of the CPD profile. Um, and yeah. so that's always something to keep in mind. And it's good to keep a record of. Uh, somebody's asked if we could share the supervision report reference. So there is a chat function in Teams, which I'm. you have to sort of click. There's like a hide Q&A button that you might have to click if you can't see it. Um, but that can show questions coming up. And it also shows we're, we're putting out links um, as we go through this webinar of relevant content. So the link to the supervision report is in there if you haven't seen it already. Oh, thank you, Olivia. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Perfect. So I'm glad questions are coming in because it always helps us to feel that we're helping you with your individual queries, which is really nice. So a little bit more about supervision, because I thought some of the stuff in this report is really, really interesting to you. Um, and this is the these are the barriers to effective and clinical and peer supervision, which I think they're worth looking at. This is the reason why it doesn't happen. Now, I'm glad to hear that in 70% of you it does happen, um, but these are some of the reasons why uh, professionals said that it didn't happen. Um, and I think lack of time and resources is one big one that comes up quite a lot. And for midwives, particularly interestingly, it was seen as quite a luxury and a bit self-indulgent to have clinical supervision. We're not very good as health professionals about allowing, as I said, to have some time and space to think about ourselves rather than other people. And some people saw that supervision was actually just about chatting um, and it wasn't part of real work. Um, and, you know, that it needs that chatting is actually more than just chatting. Um, and some people didn't do it because there were pressures on resource, pressures on staff time, um, and it had a cost implication because it can take people away from their, their regular jobs and that can be difficult as well. So managers, the managers on the call have to be committed to clinical supervision and committed to the concept of it really. Um, and the report suggests that it should be seen as the norm. Um, they talked about supervision training um, and support and they specified the things that should be covered in training and support. And I know lots of people will have accessed supervisory training um, and it talks about how you cope with difficult situations, um, difficulty in giving a feedback and how difficult that can be. Um, and it talks about the lack of relationship and trust. So, you know, some terrible things in, in the report which talked about an unhelpful, I, I was really disturbed when I read this, an unhelpful, an unhelpful supervisor is impatient uncommitted, late and inconsistent. So you definitely wouldn't want a supervisor that's that's any of, of those things. Um, and also about the understanding of what a supervisor is and the purpose. Um, and it's not about being watched over in clinical practice, as some, again, midwives thought. It's actually about discussing what happened in clinical practice in a very safe place. And there are lots of contextual factors um, that's mentioned. Shift work, for example, how difficult it is when people are working shifts to actually get together. Um, and meeting targets, the pressure to meet targets, um, and actually the organisational factors that sort of con conspire against you to have this really important supervision. Um, so this is what good supervision looks like, those four things. We've talked about them quite a bit already. Um, it should be in an open, supportive and safe environment. There should be a good relationship between you and your supervisor. Um, and it should be good quality relationship. You know, time should be offered to do it in a, a very quality way. Um, there should be cultural awareness. So supervisors, you know, need to acknowledge that we're all unique um, and everybody has their own self-identity and that's really, really important. And also there needs to be quality and timely feedback, uh, but 
delivered in a really supportive way. And we're going to look, we will look at feedback in, in future sessions and the importance of regular and constructive feedback. That's really, really important. It's part of being a good leader and being a good manager. So what's best practice uh, in supervision? The report gives some really good, really good sort of central constructive advice. It's a really clear advice. And it says that uh, it should be at least every, at least it should, clinical supervision should, and peer supervision should last about 60 minutes. Uh, it should be regular. So it's no good doing it and then not keeping it regular. And sometimes it's always good when you're having supervision to book the next one because that keeps it regular. They recommend it should be at least monthly, but obviously weekly would be even better. But I think the re report's quite realistic in, in saying that actually monthly is probably what most people can, can cope with, particularly at the moment. Um, so the other things it talks about is the 10 characteristics of effective clinical and peer supervision. And I really like these and I think that what they can what you can think maybe in your reflections uh, for your CPD is you could devise a chart and actually tick off these things. So is your you know, clinical supervision, does it involve trust and respect? Did you have a choice of supervisor? That can be difficult because the ACPC doesn't specifically say, it doesn't say what your supervision should look like. And indeed, it doesn't specifically say who your supervision should be given by. So I was reading one of the inquiry lines that actually came in a few weeks ago and it was from a drama therapist who was saying that she'd been offered a supervision by a mental health nurse who was her manager. Um, and again, we don't specify who it should be. It's who the best person for you is in your organisation. Um, there should be a shared understanding about what supervision, supervision is and that's important right at the beginning to set the scene. What are we doing here today? What are we going to work out? What are we going to discuss? Um, it should provide support and it should be regular. We've all already talked about, but based on your individual needs. So based on what you want to get out of supervision uh, and there should be some protected time for that. And we've already talked about training and, and trying to be flexible in working out when the best time for supervision is. And it can be indeed delivered by several supervisors, which can make it you know, a little bit more feasible. Now, the difficulties at the moment is that supervision is most of supervision is done remotely or may need to be done remotely. And, and indeed, given that we didn't know what COVID was going to happen in 2019, um, this report actually looks at distance supervision and thinking about can it be effective? And I thought this was really useful because actually it gives some real tips for the fact that supervision can still happen even in a pandemic. Um, and it clearly says that even remote supervision can help emotional support, um, but it must focus on what the individual brings to the supervision discussion to make it effective really um, and it's obviously if you're doing remote supervision or distance supervision uh, it's it best occurred when there's no need to or requirement to observe, observe professional practice so it can be done remotely um, and I thought we've we've had this uh, query in uh, on our advice line um, Varna is a hearing aid dispenser she works in a small self-run business uh, but she's recognising the importance of clinical supervision, but thinking about how can she organise it for herself? Now that can be quite difficult, particularly if you're in a single practice, um, and it can be quite difficult. And it's about thinking a bit laterally. So thinking about perhaps linking up with any dispensers locally or indeed any other um, healthcare uh, environments locally where there are groups of practitioners who might be doing supervision and you might actually agree to do it for each other. Um, so it's finding somebody that you trust and putting out something maybe on a network, on a circular, you're looking for a supervisor, is there anybody around and forming a network really. Um, it can be done virtually as we've already said, um, but it might be useful to use some sort of reflective framework. So I think that can actually that can actually work quite well um, and using some sort of criteria to organise it, but it can be done locally. So Varna, what I would say to you is look at little, look a little bit out of your local network and think about who can provide clinical supervision for you. So Olivia, I'm going to come to see if we've got any more questions before we uh, do our final bits and bobs. Anything else that's coming up? Let me just check. Um, I think so. I think I've just spotted a question in the chat about if your organisation is not supportive of supervision. Uh, so what, what you might do, because I think it's important that obviously this is we're talking about um, what should be happening, what is best practice. I think uh, the unfortunate reality is that for some employers, um, for many uh, registrants, they might find that actually pressures of work uh, mean that supervision isn't prioritised and they're not feeling like they're getting perhaps the support that they need. 
Um, so I think it's firstly it's really important if you do have those concerns to be quite open with your manager or your employer, whatever structures are in place about that. Um, your employer is recruiting you, um, employing you as a HCPC registrant and it's they are recruiting you with uh, that registration to meet our standards. So it's really important that they are supporting you to meet those standards and therefore in, in the relation to this particular standard, um, if your work is being delegated to you, you're getting some form of supervision from the person who's delegated that work to you to make sure that you're still practicing in line of our standards. So it is important that they are um, aware of any concerns that you might have. Uh, you might also want to talk to your trade union or professional body um, and they might be able to support you with those sorts of conversations that you're having with your employer. Um, but another option that might be is that you might want to think about a more informal arrangement of supervision and perhaps um, getting involved with a uh, sort of support network group that's yeah. your profession run, trying to speak to peers. Um, obviously the more uh, formal the structure and support of your employer are, is the better but that doesn't mean that you can't um, perhaps seek out um, some form of arrangement yourself as well or take advantage of sort of speaking to your peers to try and give you that space to reflect and learn in your practice and get that support. Yeah thanks thanks Olivia that's that's great that's really helpful. Um, it can be difficult can't it really particularly um, with time pressures and resource and cost implications I totally get that it can be really difficult. Okay, thank you very much, Olivia. So other resources that we wanted to signpost you to, there's one really important one. Um, over the next month or so, we're actually encouraging applications for our HCPC Council Apprenticeship, which I think would be an amazing experience. So that stuff is on our, our, our web, our internet, should I say, and I know that Holly will pop the link up to that. So if you know anybody who might be interested, um, that's a really interesting job to see what the HCPC Council do. Um, We've also got our COVID hub, which we constantly talk about. We've got some really, really useful stuff, particularly um, at the moment. So that's that's all up on our website. And we've also got all the other stuff on our website that's that's really useful to you. So that that's really, really relevant. Um, save the date for the next session, um, Tuesday the 8th of December, one more before Christmas at four o'clock. We do these at different times to see if they help people at different times of the day. Um, we're looking at standard five and confidentiality. So I'm hoping that will be really really interesting for you. Um, and just a reminder of what we've covered today, we've looked at delegation, we've looked at delegating, we've looked at things like Sunita and Samantha, we've looked at Varna and her supervision issues, we've looked at some of our HCPC reports about clinical supervision. Um, so I'm hoping that you found that useful. What I'd like to do before we finish is ask your patients, and I'm asking if you wouldn't mind answering a couple of questions for us again. We need to know that this webinar is useful to you. So going back to rating your understanding of standard four of our standard conduct and performance and ethics, this is what we've discussed uh, for the last 45 minutes. After this session, so now, how do you rate it? Is it better? Is it worse? Thinking about what you put last time. Um, do It's all anonymous, by the way. We can't actually find out who each individual is, but it's, it's just really nice again for us to see whether we've made a difference in your understanding. That's what we would have hoped to have done, but we understand if we haven't. It's just taking a little while, I can see, for the votes to come in um, and to go up to California, as they say, and come back again. Um, but it's it's really useful. We want to spend the time on these webinars that happen every, about every three weeks to make them interesting and informative for you. And I should just say that they are all available on our HCPC YouTube channel. Um, they're all available there for you to look back at if you want to um, and watch them. And if anybody's got any students or um, any pre-registration students in any way, they might be really useful to them um, to look at. We always think that they're really nice for pre-registration. Um, students as well. So thank you for that. That's that's fine. That's very heartening and I'll compare that to my previous slide. Um, and my next uh, question, just a couple more questions. Again, when you think of the HCPC, um, what word comes to mind? Do type in type in words. It's interesting to see whether it's changed from last time. I remember the massive one in the, in the middle last time at the beginning of the session was all about regulation. Somebody said didn't get the link till the end. I'm really sorry if you didn't get the link. I feel very bad about that. So sorry, so sorry about that. Um, we hope to be supportive. That is what these webinars are about. They are about us engaging with you as registrants um, to find out what your issues are and what your concerns are. I mean, as we've already said, we do get a lot of inquiries to Olivia, Grace and Matt um, 
but it's nice to clear up some of those things face to face, which is a really nice thing to do. So thank you very much for those. I'll just allow it for a few more minutes because typing sometimes takes a little bit, doesn't it? And actually, while you're typing those in, I'm going to say a big thank you, particularly to Olivia, Grace and Matthew, who've put themselves out there to answer your questions in person, um, which thank you very much, the three of you. And also, I'm going to go to my next session, my next question while I'm talking over that um, and how often how likely are you to recommend this training to your colleagues uh, but thank you to Matt Grace and Olivia Hart who are truly our experts in standards and guidance and also Holly for sending out so much information beforehand and just a quick repeat to remember that if you do the evaluation we send you after this session which is quite quick it takes about three minutes we've worked out so we actually can see how long it takes to complete our evaluation um, survey at the end then we will send you a certificate to show that you've been to a session today uh, which is quite nice so thank you for that that's really positive and one more question actually two more questions has this set is an easy one has this session helped you to reflect on your practice yes or no is quite a useful one for us because it's all about you thinking about your practice isn't it really i think um, training's great, isn't it? Training and education, but it's about taking that information back um, and probably you reflecting on this training and thinking about whether it was useful to you or not is, is always really nice. So thank you. Thank you. for That's very positive. Thank you very much. And one last question. So thank you for the last one. Has your knowledge of the HCPC improved? Yes, no, or it was already good. Um, that's the last one. And that's the last question we'll actually ask you. But we find we spend a lot of time after these sessions actually looking at your answers and seeing whether we're hitting the mark really. And if we're not hitting the mark, we use the information to improve the next one. Um, because what we found, for example, after the first couple was that we want you wanted some more case studies um, because you find them really useful. So we're using real life case studies to actually help help the session. So that's a partly what how you're driving those improvements. So thank you very much for those. Um, this is how you get in touch with us. We are always there. That's our job to respond to you, our customers um, in different ways. So that's our professional liaison. Um, website, oh, sorry, email if you want us to do any sessions for anybody else, our professional liaison, but also the policy department, which is Olivia, Grace and Matthew, but a couple of other colleagues as well, but they'll always answer your questions, registrations and our fitness to practice uh, colleagues as well. Um, and finally, a really big thank you to you. I think Grace already mentioned how impressed she was when she gets the inquiries to how people are particularly adapted to the COVID environment. But we wanted to thank you for everything you do for the NHS and for whoever you work for, because I know some of you don't work for the NHS, but you're all giving healthcare in different ways. And we wanted to stay, say thank you very much for everything you do. Um, so any final questions, Olivia, quickly before we finish? No, nothing that I've seen um, coming through, uh, nothing on the chat, so. That's fine. Well, thank you very much for your time and energy this afternoon, and it's been great. Thank you for bearing with us with the Slido and for completing those evaluation. We will send you a link uh, to the survey um, that Holly will send out, and we will um, send you a certificate, but we really appreciate your time this afternoon. Uh, take care and have a lovely rest of the day, and have a, indeed, because it's Friday, have a lovely weekend. Take care. <laughs>